Welcome, you poor unfortunate souls, to this episode of Man, Buns, and Jesus. Uh, we are in season two. This is episode 18, and I'm one of your hosts, Pastor Josh Laborious, out in East Vale, California, and surrounding cities, and over in some direction, if you're watching the video, uh, the other one of the other voices on the podcast, Ben Olschlager, the degenerate from Lake Orion, Michigan. How you doing, Ben? I'm doing pretty good, Josh. You having a good week? Eh, I'm, I'm going on vacation next week, so like... There you go. So next week will be a good week. So uh, today we are talking about worship. Um, we have on the podcast today another one of our classmates, Mr. Evan Dean, who pastors a church, what, half an hour from me-ish? Yeah. Uh, in a blip in a cornfield. Um that is Dryden, Michigan. I I hope I don't offend everyone in the town of Dryden, but we're not even a town; of, we're a village. Okay, the village of Dryden. <laughs> Can I go there to get quests? Uh probably not. Okay. Oh darn. Yeah. It just I'm go it, ask it, the it's, it's local the... blacksmith to collect materials <laughs> for him or something. <laughs> Where does the background as you drive through to go get it? Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, between the three of us, we feel like we pretty well span the uh, the spectrum of worship styles. Josh's church is, is very contemporary. Um, I've kind of run the gamut at this point in my life and find myself squarely in the middle at, at the congregation I'm at here, uh, fairly low church traditional. And then our, our buddy Evan here, uh, we can't call him high church because that would be uh, an insult to him and all things high church. Uh, simultaneously um but misnomer call... would have been the better way to phrase that <laughs> than what calling it a misnomer instead of an insult that would have been I more mean... pc of you <laughs> sure but we just aim to offend here so i'm just being honest um <laughs> anyway Evan, our friend here, is uh, squarely in the traditional church camp. Um, we, we've had conversations about the divine services and which is our favorite. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you have a strong opinion on that from last time we chatted. Um, at least which one wasn't your favorite? Uh, I, I think it was more of a, my congregation. Bless uh, her, okay. We tried to do divine service too. And um, after two weeks, we decided we're never going to try to do that one again. Okay, fair enough. Do anyway, I need to get my hymnal out to engage with this conversation. No, no, no. Not. <laughs> so the reason that we are here today with this uh, spectrum of worship styles is that there's oftentimes a lot of animosity between people within um, the church at large, and especially our denomination, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, over what we do in worship. Um, and so today, our conversation focuses on how, as people across this worship spectrum, um, and it's not even really a spectrum, it's just kind of a, a difference in preferences, um, how people across this set of differences can, one, learn from each other, two, encourage each other, and three, build up each other uh, so that we truly can be a united church. because. You know, the preferences of Josh's uh, church in California are probably going to be different than mine in suburban Detroit or Evans in the sticks, you know, like we, we have to be able to adjust to the populations around us and the people that we have in our pews. Uh, and so how do we do that faithfully and how do we do that in such a way that doesn't demean the church down the road and Evans case literally. Uh, now that I've talked smack about Dryden for five minutes. <laughs> well, I, I don't know where you were going with this, Ben, but I think it might be beneficial for us to each kind of describe what worship looks like at our church for anyone listening who might not be familiar with these, these terms of contemporary versus low church traditional versus higher church traditional versus high church. Um, so I can go ahead and start. And since I'm at the bottom of this, of this vertical scale, <laughs> um, 
if you're if you're a member of Edgewater, you obviously know what our worship looks like, but I guess now you might know a little bit more of the why we do certain things, but um, our service can look different from week to week, but it always contains several things. Um, we always speak one of the creeds. It's always there. Um, we tend to alternate between Nicene Creed and Apostolic Creed. Um, fifth Sunday is a wild card, I suppose. And we always have confession and absolution. Um, it's very close to what you would find in a traditional service, but it's a little more, the language is a little bit more accessible or what I would consider more accessible. Um, we always have readings, two readings. We always have a sermon. We always have communion. Well, we always have communion when an ordained minister is present. Um, and we always have songs. So like that's that's what's always there in those. Oh, and we always have prayers. And those kind of move around depending on what the needs of the service are. But those those are the elements that for us have to be there every time. Um, but what it what it typically looks like is we have a band. We have a band there up front, uh, guitar, electric guitar, um, bass, drums. We typically have a keyboard. Sometimes we have two keyboards and a couple of vocalists. Um, uh, it's music that you'd probably hear on a contemporary Christian radio station. Um, and so we typically, and, and I think this is one of the things that really makes us distinct from maybe your guys' congregations is we do almost all of our music in one chunk. Um, at the beginning, we have a worship set and that is mostly for the musicians because, you know, getting set up and then going down and then getting back up and like, it makes things easier for them. Um, but also because of the way our church is set up, which for anyone listening who doesn't know, we're, we don't have our own space. We're in a, we're in a local school's multi-purpose room. Um, it would be very distracting for them to come up and sit down and come up and sit down during the service. So instead we have, they have their worship set at the beginning and then they do one song during the distribution for communion. And they, they stay because we do communion toward the end most weeks. Um, and then they stay and, and do one song during the benediction. So that at its kind of a brief outline is what our services look like as the contemporary representative here. How about you, Evan? What do you got? I mean, if we're going to list off what we have, the same list of what Josh has in his service is what we have here in Holy Redeemer here in Dryden. Except the large thing that's going to probably separate us is that our music uh, instruments that we use and our order of service. Well, Josh kind of says he's a little bit more flexible. Um, my church uses the divine services that are printed out in the Lutheran service book. Um, and for the most part, we use either um, divine service one, four, or five. For those who knows the lingo, it's just the pages and orders that are put together for it, um, that are put together by smarter men than myself, and lean off of their thing, th thinking and reason for it that connect all the way back to the historic church. Um, but for, like Josh says, we use, for the most part, two creeds, either the Apostles or the Nicene Creed. We have readings, we have prayers, all the things that Josh listed out, except we kind of follow the order that's put out in the hymnal. And for our music, we're blessed with two musicians. One, I have um, my organist who plays the traditional organ and hymns that are found in our hymnal. And then we also have a musician who's blessed to play the keyboard and a handful of other instruments. And she plays hymns on those as well, but also sometimes, I don't want to say contemporary because they are contemporary when I was in elementary school, kind of the more of the um, the contemporary that a lot of people knew and are familiar with in our congregation. We sing those from time to time, but still have communion every week, um, as long as me as the ordained pastor is there, 
And from that, nothing too outstandish, but something that might be recognizable if you walk into most LCMS churches across the country, but not all of them. So, and then the, the big difference between myself and Evan, uh, probably more than anything is just the way that we do our services. I also base most of my services off of the divine services in the hymnal. Um, but I, I just start there with a, as a framework and then kind of run with it. Um, so sometimes I'll change up the, the way that the uh, order of confession is, is worded, uh, not to change the content of what we're trying to do, but just to try and change like, hey, this week I'm especially you know hitting on this particular sin that I think maybe the congregation is dealing with. And maybe I want you to really think about that as we're confessing. Um, uh, sometimes I will add or drop things that are in the, in the order, um, that I feel like are a little bit more, um, ornamental, I guess, to the service, not necessarily, uh, necessary for the function of what we want to do on a Sunday morning. But like the same things that you guys listed off, you know, readings, confession, creeds. Um, we only do communion twice a month. Uh, that's just because we have a small group that's willing to set up and tear down for that. Um, and I don't want to overwork them. But, um, you know, prayers of the church, benediction, a sermon, those things are all elements of the, of the service that we have to. Um, and then, you know, our music kind of differs from week to week. A lot of it's hymns from the hymnal, but sometimes I'll, I'll mix in a, a contemporary hymn um, or like once a month, we try to have in uh, a guy that's a friend of the congregation um, who does kind of a folksy uh, one man band contemporary service. Um, and for that, for our congregation, for our space, for our culture, that fits well. Uh, it, it's not like overly showy, like some places can be or it doesn't feel forced uh like it can be in other ways um so that's where each of us stands kind of on this uh spectrum of of uh worship also worth noting uh, i don't robe up for our late service um that's just a personal choice uh, and uh, just a brief nod and you guys can correct me if i'm wrong um so the 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 faction, I guess I shouldn't use that word, but I'm going to um, not represented here. So like high church, high church, um, they're going to have a lot of the same stuff that the rest of us do. And and what you might have noticed thus far is the differences are in. A lot of times they're in the littler things. Mm -hmm. So the stuff you do in between parts of the service, the order you do things in. Um, how you dress, how you move from space to space in the church. So when I move, like I wear a suit on Sundays, that's it. Um, and there's no really prescribed order to when I go, where I go, other than I'm a creature of habit. So like I always come up from the right side of the, of the, of the broom, but that's just because that's the side I started coming up on. So that's the side I continue to come up on. Mm -hmm. um, whereas high church, they tend to, they have the robes. Uh, if they're doing communion, I believe there's a chasuble involved, which if you're, if you have no idea what that is, Google it. Like that's going to be the easiest way for you to figure out what it looks like. It's a cape. Um, it, yeah, kind of. Surgical <laughs> blanket. Yeah, yeah, the liturgical poncho. That's the best. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. Um, they're some, high, like, really high church, they're going to maybe swing incense, and they're going to have that involved, which is smelly smoke. Again, for anyone who's not familiar with incense, um, you burn stuff that smells good. And, uh, and they're just, they're very... They tend to be defined by they very rigidly follow a structure. Mm -hmm. And in um, that structure, they sometimes have very deliberate movements and actions that they do, like 
bowing at certain times, genuflecting at certain times, or just kind of getting on a knee and bowing towards the altar and all those little things make up different parts of the high church style. Mm -hmm. It's a good note. I think I interrupted you, Ben, but no, you're good. I was just going to say, so that's kind of laying out where each of us is at in this whole thing. Um, And now I'm going to challenge each of my two friends here uh, with the challenge they did not see coming. But what I want you, you each to do is I want you to name like the thing that you think the style of worship that you are most comfortable with that, that your church uses. um, What gift does it really bring to the conversation around worship? What does it really highlight and emphasize that maybe at times gets forgotten in other, in other styles or forms of worship? I can start that off. Um, one thing I think that my church, the congregation here, really likes is the um, continuation and um, consistency that it's offered. I've had many people that mention that this is what they grew up with. This is what they're most familiar with. or It's what to them feels like worship. And so by offering this, sometimes in a world with a lot of different changing practices, mm-hmm. for my congregation, which tends to be a bit older, it, it's a place of refuge for them. And when the world's changing, there's something that's constant here for them. Josh, what do you Um, got? So almost contrasting from that, um, the biggest, so I I grew up on traditional, um, probably closer to Ben's traditional than Evan's traditional. Um, And in undergrad, I went to, it wasn't high church, but it was was pretty close. Um, And what I have found, I think I appreciate most, especially as a pastor going through a contemporary service, is there is a lot of flexibility there for me to meet the needs of the service, the needs of the congregation. So so like an example of what I'm talking about is um, months, maybe even a year ago at this point, this is one of my very early sermons there it was a very heavy sermon just on the reality of sin and brokenness so i skipped the confession and absolution from its normal place in the service right so typically we do um we do our worship set we do a prayer we, and then we go into confession and absolution we skipped it and it was inserted in the sermon So like there was a point during the sermon where I was like, essentially, I was like, everybody feeling pretty bad right now. Yeah, everybody's like feeling like they suck, which which is appropriate, right? That's what I was going for. I was like, so we're going to do confession absolution. We didn't do it earlier. We're going to do it now to kind of maximize the impact of it. Um, Another instance is our our kiddos leave at, at a certain part of the service to go to Sunday school. So like the adults stay and listen to the sermon, the kids go to Sunday school. Um, But that also means they tend to miss communion because communion is at the end of the service. And um, not that they're taking communion because they're they're younger, but they're not there to experience it. They're not there as part of the community. So one Sunday a month, we flip the service. And we, we, the very first thing we do is confession and absolution. And then the very second thing we do is communion, because I think it's important to, to do confession and absolution before you do communion. Um, so like there's the flexibility there. And if I need to move the, like uh, when we did Trinity Sunday and we did the Athanasian Creed, I moved the creed to the children's message. And I had the kids count the, I, a couple of the kids counted when they heard the word father, a couple of kids counted when they heard the word son, a couple of kids counted when they heard spirit or Holy Spirit to kind of compare. And then, you know, the summary was like, look how important each of these figures are when we're understanding who God is and what God does. Um, 
So like I moved to the Crete. So that's what I really appreciate about the contemporary style or model, however you want to describe it, is there's a lot of flexibility there for teaching, for meeting the needs of the congregation. Um, but admittedly, you know, and some of my congregation members can attest to this, if you're looking for consistency, sometimes it's our service can be a little uncomfortable. Um, like I'm just thinking the way we do prayers, we do prayers differently every week. So one week of the month, we do them probably a lot like Evans Church does them. It's the very traditional um, in peace, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. And it's that litany, litany, is that the right word? I don't, it doesn't matter. Sounds um, right. Another week of the month, I have everyone in the congregation circle up with people next to them. And I say, hey, pray for people in your lives who are sick and suffering. And in their little circles, they, they pray. That makes a lot of people really uncomfortable. Um, I'm, and if you're listening to this, I am aware that it makes a lot of the congregation really uncomfortable. I'm going to keep doing it because it's worthwhile. So if you're listening to this, hoping that you're going to like glean something, that you're going to get me to stop doing that, it, you're, you're not. We're going to keep doing it. Um, but yeah, the flexibility is what I like. Uh, what about you, Ben? What do you particularly value about your church's uh, style? I think I get to do the, the nicest possible bait and switch in, in human history. Um, I'm Like I said, because I find myself between you two, um, I oftentimes give myself the flexibility of a contemporary service while still being in the familiarity of a traditional service. Um, we generally alternate between the, the structures of, of Divine Service 1 and Divine Service 4. Um, but then in, 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 in those services, at times I give myself the opportunity to just do something completely different. Um, an example of this last summer, um, I was teaching on meditating the Psalms. I was preaching on meditating on the Psalms. Um, and just saying, you know, this is a good practice for us to partake in because, it can bring us rest. Uh, it can teach us a lot about the, the nature of the God we, we love and, uh, and worship. And it's just a, a good habit to get into. Um, and then at the end of the service, rather than having a hymn, like, you know, when most people kind of expect a song as they're, as they're walking out, I said, all right, everybody spread out, uh, shut up for a couple minutes. Uh, and I'm just going to really slowly and methodically read through this psalm. And we're just going to sit here and meditate. Um, and everybody was like either super uncomfortable or super into it. <laughs> and it was like, it was a lot of fun to just kind of do something in a spot that would be very familiar, but it was so jarring that it was like, it, it really stood out. And so I think, to kind of emphasize what Josh was saying, because I allow myself so much flexibility, even within a traditional structure, it helps me to kind of teach and catechize throughout a service in a way that if I was following a more rigid order, I may not feel comfortable or have the opportunity to do. Um, Another example of this might be, I've been planning, I haven't broken it out yet, but I've been planning a service of silence where rather than um, in, engaging the congregation in uh, worship and music, we spend time in silence and thought and meditation and prayer <laughs> and like just really make people consider what we're doing there in the worship service so that you know, we, we do a, a chunk of, of the liturgy. We talk through confession and absolution. And then I say, all right, take a few minutes. Think about what we've just done. And people just have to sit there and wrestle with the fact that we've confessed our sin and that God is gracious enough to forgive us in that. Like, that's the kind of thing that if, if we were in a, in a really traditional setting where we were really strictly following liturgies, um, 
I wouldn't feel comfortable doing. But here, because I've well, kind of established and, a, a history of doing weird things, I've I've given myself that opportunity. <laughs> and here's something that I think is a weakness of the flexibility that we have and a strength of, of the structure that Evan follows. Good, because this was going to be my next question, was going to be, now you have to compliment uh, everyone else's. <laughs> well, then I'll start. Um, because I hear I hear your idea for a service of, silence, uh, service of silence, and you know what my first thought is? Some guys are going to have major changes to their fantasy football team the second they walk out of church. <laughs> Because you're going to say, now think about the confession absolution. They're going to be like, I wonder if Julio Jones is going to pop off today. Or like, they're not going to be thinking about maybe what they should be thinking about. But the advantage of um, especially Evans and, and even higher church, kind of the structure that you follow every week is it does, it conditions your mind to work a certain way. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and kind of the simple is if you're thinking, what do you mean by that? You expect something to come next. Right. So if you're following a very. Um, a particular structure. After the, you know, after the. After the confession, you expect the absolution. After the readings, maybe you expect the sermon, um, like you expect things to go in a certain order. And what that communicates to me is that your mind is being shaped to kind of these are the these are the paths we go through. So I think there's a lot of advantage to structure and even all of our examples of, you know, flexibility being used to teach. They mean more because we're deviating from an established pattern. Mm -hmm. So even though my structure maybe is more flexible than Evan's, I think what Evan's structure does is it provides mental habits for people to go through. And if necessary, you can create a huge impact by changing the structure. If you have no structure, then doing something different has no impact, right? Which is why I think it's important that like if you're going to change structure, no matter what the structure looks like, you better have a good reason for it. Right, you don't just do it because you're feeling creative. There, there should be a point. Um, so I think that's the real benefit of the structure that you were talking about Evan that you're forming a habit you're forming mental patterns and and you're setting something up that is is really important. Do I have to say something nice about yours too, Ben? Only if you want. Eh. The pastor of Ben's services has really nice hair. Oh, that was that was super soft, Ben. That was 10 <laughs> ply. I'll own it. I'll own it. Ivan, you want to go next? Yeah, I mean, just to kind of echo Josh's point about what my service has that his order my order has that his order doesn't is the same reason why it's so intriguing to look at that because we have such i don't want to say rigidness in our order but sometimes when you're too rigid things can become an issue if you don't do it correctly like um a deer acolyte um, was lighting the candles and he went the wrong way which for some people like well that's not the right way to do it and so sometimes when you have the the freedom of changing up your services, doing things a little bit differently, it, it gets them to start thinking about why these things are done, not just when and how they're done. Because if you think about, well, why do we have um, confession before we go to Lord's Supper? Oh, it's to confess our sins and remind us that we shouldn't go up with hatred in our hearts for our brother and sister sin next to us when we go and commune and receive the Lord's Supper together. But sometimes they're so far apart that you're missing out those that connection between it. And so having the freedom to move it would be great to do it. But I'd have a lot of talk from people like, Pastor, we're okay with what you did, but can we not do that again next week? 
<laughs> and, and so and, and you, that means well. you have a very polite congregation. Good, good for <laughs> you, Evans congregation. Uh, some of them might say a little more bluntly, but <laughs> that's yeah, not how we do things. Stop says. it. <laughs> but with with the freedom to move things around, again, it goes back to the different style of teaching that can be brought out in it. If you're mm -hmm. focused, I mean, like with um, Ben talking about focusing on a different sin for confession and absolution. If, if I can change up the words, it throws off the people in the congregation, but then it also starts to like, well, why are we saying these words? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the the change in words can make it more than just robotic response. Because I think sometimes we can get in the habit of saying the creed, but not really confessing the creed. And so by changing up something like confession and absolution, where you say you confess your sins, but have a chance to reflect on the words you're saying this week in a different manner, helps to drive the point home more sometimes. So I think speaking, again, one more time speaking to this idea of, of really highlighting the repetition of things. Um, I had a funeral on Tuesday. We're recording this on Thursday, September 1st. I had a funeral two days ago. And at said funeral, um, a member of Evan's congregation who happens to be a, a deacon of the church, um, was sharing some memories of his time visiting this this member of mine uh well my church had a, vac uh, a vacancy a few years ago and uh this woman had dementia she struggled with her memory um and by the time that i got to know her um she would remember who i was for about 15 seconds before thinking i was a pastor that hadn't that retired like 15 years ago um and is 50-ish years my senior um but when you prayed the lord's prayer when you walked through the creeds when i spoke the words of of institution for communion you could see the recognition reappear in her eyes she knew what was happening she knew what was going on and she valued that and so hearing these things over and over and over again really can be an incredibly valuable tool for helping people uh, just recognize the importance of something, whether it be a statement of faith like the creeds, whether it be uh, forgiveness of sins. The last time that I went to see her, her memory was basically shot. Um, but one of the few things that she still remembered was Jesus loves her. And that simple proclamation of the gospel brought a massive smile to her face. Um, so like, if you're really driving points home with something like a, a very liturgical service, it can be a great tool. Um, but then on the flip side, I, I spent some time in a congregation that was in a, in a situation very much like Josh's where we were setting up every week. Um, our, we actually had to switch homes halfway through my year there. Uh, because the building that we were renting got sold out from underneath us. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's like, there's a level of ownership that a lot of those churches feel um, about their worship. The fact that uh, it is for them, it is driven by them uh, as a, a an expression of what they feel for the God who loves them and has sacrificed himself for them. Um, and so for them, there's an incredibly personal connection to that. Uh, and I think that can be an incredibly valuable tool too. I think that can be fostered at a, a more traditional congregation, but I think it comes more naturally in a, in a setting like a church plant or a, a very contemporary church where the, the people kind of get to drive the, the worship style and the, some of the choices. Um, they take ownership in setting up and tearing down tables and chairs. They take ownership in, in buying donuts and coffee. They take, you know, ownership. Shout in... out to the Marsh family. Those are some... <laughs> they, they recently switched the donut shop they go to. And guys, I'm telling you, these donuts are so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Sunrise Donut. I think it was Sunrise Donuts in Omaha. 
Omaha, Nebraska. It's where my my vicarage church got our donuts. Those were fire. Um, but like, there there's some some weird. Mm, weird's not the right word. Some odd and, and unique habits that some of these churches pick up, but it really helps engage them in, in worship in a way that is meaningful to them. And I don't think you can get that quite as easily at, at a church, even like mine, where we have some flexibility. So yeah, I value that. Um, I don't know if you had a, a direction where you wanted to go next, Ben. I do. I do. Well, so what, what's yours? And then we'll, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> I just wanted to briefly talk about what a stupid thing it is to argue about this stuff. That's basically where I was going. Right. Next. <laughs> like if, if you've been listening, all three of our services, we have a lot of the core elements the same. Each of our three services has strengths and has weaknesses that we're will we're willing and ready to admit. Um, but each of our services connects the people in our congregation to the gospel. I have no doubt that the people at Evans Church, that the people at Ben's Church, um, they are connected to the forgiveness of sins, to the gospel every single week. I, I am convinced that it, at all of our churches, every week people are discipled a little bit more than they were when they came in that morning. Um, so what a stupid thing for us to argue about, right? And this is something I, cause if you're not really familiar with the, the Lutheran church, like this is one of historically, I think our favorite things to get really uptight about and get really upset with each other about. And I'm sitting here thinking like, can we, can we not? <laughs> Like, it's, oh man, it's, it's just, I think it's really silly. And I do, I, what I think, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the younger generations of the church. So like, I'm thinking our classmates at the seminary are less inclined to argue about, to like, get really upset about this than maybe some generations that went before us. And I suspect that's because we have bigger fish to fry, right? Like we don't have a culture that's pulling for us anymore. Where our, our people aren't discipled just by drinking the water. So um, we have bigger issues to deal with than which songs we use in worship. Um, so that's, I'm kind of optimistic about the future that maybe we'll, maybe we'll stop arguing about this, at least on a large scale, but I don't know, maybe I'm just being an optimist, which would not be on brand for me. So <laughs> I so I'll admit the thing that brought this conversation up in the first place, at least in my head, um, and this is unbeknownst to either of you, I guess. Unbeknownst? Uh, yeah. That's what I said. Anyway. Um at the Michigan District Convention, where Evan and I both were, uh, what, two months ago, month and a half ago, two months ago, um, there was a, uh, what do they call it? Not a motion. Resolution. Yes. Thank resolution. you. Thank you, Evan. There's a resolution before the floor. Uh, basically, that, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but said, hey, if your neighborhood, if your neighboring church does worship differently than you, speak highly of them. They're still proclaiming the gospel. Um, Please tell me that resolution passed. It did. But here's the stupid part. It got pushback. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation today. Because, like, if I showed up at Evans Church, which admittedly is not, you know, the highest of high churches. If I showed up at our buddy Mason's church in Elkhart, Indiana, uh, which is actually Evans' home church, uh, uh, just a little peek behind the curtain here. Um, 
would I feel uncomfortable and out of place? Maybe a little bit because I'm not super used to high church, uh, like worship settings, but I would leave there knowing that the gospel has been proclaimed, especially if Mason's preaching. If I go to Evan's church, same thing. If I go to Josh's church, same thing. And so I'm not going to badmouth another church in our denomination, in our circuits, unless they are truly doing the work of the devil, right? Like if they're attempting to divide our, our body, uh, the body of Christ, not just the, the Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, because, you know, if Gibbs heard us talking about this too glowingly, he might... Uh, strap us into the hermeneutical harness or something um that's a reference that like no one who listens to this podcast is going to understand just that's just okay. move on just move on <laughs> it's fine just yeah. keep going <laughs> anyway so the only time that i will ever speak and not even speak ill but like speak against a congregation outside of my own is if they are truly doing something to divide the body of christ that's it. I think there's a there's there are other reasons that like I'd go and have a conference, not a confrontational, but a more a sticky conversation with a fellow pastor. Like if they're just doing something that is stupid. Yeah. Like is that divisive in the body of Christ? You can do things that aren't div divisive that are like still problematic right but are they ultimately divisive i'm making them divisive <laughs> i mean whatever cool. whatever move on sin le the, the point being sin left unchecked is ultimately divisive so like i felt like it was a good broad paintbrush to paint with um I was going to say, just kind of going off of that, I think the biggest reason a lot of this becomes an issue is because we're starting to put ourselves in front of what these services are, mm -hmm. and we let our own preferences, our own ideas, our own thoughts get in the way of it. But when you take a look at what the liturgy, the divine service, whatever you want to call it, does for us, it's doing two things. It's God giving to us his gifts, and it's us responding back to God. And the way we can do that can be completely different based on the group of people. Just like the three of us are unique, have our own preferences, our thoughts and ideas, the whole congregations that we represent all and all the congregations are gonna be different. So even my traditional service is gonna look different to the traditional service that's 20 miles away, mm -hmm. just because of how we all interact with it. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just our quirks and personalities are influenced by what are around. And I think the biggest issue is when we let that get away from ourselves, when we start putting ourselves of what can the church do for me to entertain me, enlighten me, whatever you want to call it, the Americanism of what can I get out of this yeah. makes a difference. And when we take a stop and say, what is this church doing? Well, it's proclaiming the word of Christ. It's telling of the good news. It's giving us baptism. It's giving us communion. That's what a church does. And how it does it shouldn't make a difference as long as it's doing it correctly. Chef's kiss. That, Josh, I don't know about you, but that feels like a segue into takeaways. Yeah, I'm good with I'm good with going to takeaways now. Did you All warn right, Evan so, about this or? No, absolutely not. <laughs> so you know, Evan, one of these days we're going to run into someone who actually listens to our podcast, <laughs> and we're not going to be able to spring it on them. <laughs> Yeah, so Evan, I have to say I've listened to the a few of them, but it's like the first half, and then I get distracted with something else. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can respect that. Honest. I can respect that. I'm not going to sit here. I was like, "Yep, I listened to every single one you put out." You should no, listen I to haven't. last week's. It was just because oh, it was last week's was was spicy. Anyway, um, so at the end of every episode, each of us just highlights one point from the conversation that we really want people to walk away with. Um, and so as our guest, you have the option of either going first or letting Josh go first, uh, because we left you completely unprepared for this. So if you want to take, if you want to take the softball, if you see one in front of you, go ahead. Otherwise you can pass it to Josh. I mean, I'll, I'll go for the easy softball set. At the end of the day, all of these, our churches are going to be different 
And that's okay because we're all serving different people with different needs. And the way we do it is gonna best represent the people that we're caring for. Because at the end of the day, I can't do Josh's service here in Dryden because one, they'd be confused. Two, they wouldn't like it. And three, I probably wouldn't be here too much longer after it. What's going <laughs> but, on here? <laughs> why are all our hymns up front? No. Uh, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's making sure that what we're doing is serving the people and how we do it is best connecting to our people and knowing what they're expecting and how we can teach through it. Josh, what you got? Um, I think my biggest takeaway is like, and this is more, actually, no, this is, this is broad. Don't argue about this stuff. Like recognize that some people are better served by a style of worship that you might not like get over yourself and just be happy that the gospel is being proclaimed faithfully. Right. Live in the groove. <laughs> wow, you're just full of seminary references today, aren't you? Yeah, a little bit. What about you, Ben? Do you need okay. to be asked? No, I, I'm just making sure you're done. Um, so mine is kind of a reverse of a lot of the things we talked about today. If you have issue with the way that your pastor or another pastor in your area is leading services before you start speaking ill of them or ill of that style go ask them why they do it like have a conversation about it because i will i will flat out tell you why i do the things i do um it might take way more of your time than you want to give me but i will tell you josh will do the same thing i'm sure evan would be happy to do the same thing too and so like, let's be good Christians about this and like engage in conversation when we find things we don't like. Season one, episode one, baby, coming back. I need to reproduce that so it doesn't sound like garbage. Yeah. <laughs> something, something cat feces. <laughs> no, that's episode two. I don't know. I thought that was Not episode important. one. Never mind. It might be episode one. <laughs> All right. <sighs> Josh, you have some prayer thoughts for us? Uh, yeah. Um, pray, pray that the gospel does faithfully go out. No matter what that looks like in a given community, just pray that the church keeps doing its job um, and that the, the Holy Spirit would keep working through churches and working through Christians to, to connect people to saving faith in Christ. Um, those are our, our prayer requests for the day. And uh, with that, it's shameless plug time. Um, we are to plug. Oh yeah, not that I can think of. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a new season of Rick and Morty coming out in a couple of weeks. No, that's not what these plugs are about. Um, we are on most of the popular podcasting platforms, so Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. Um, odyssey iHeartRadio, um all that kind of stuff i think if you have an alexa you can tell alexa to play man buns and jesus and it will i'm i'm pretty sure that works um try my google home when i get i'm like to... i'm like 70 percent sure that works actually um we're on spotify we're on podbean um and i believe in the next week or so we should finally be on pandora I resubmitted it and it looks like they're actually going to get their poop in a group this time. So um, the wait is over folks. The wait is yeah, over. Yeah. If you're a Pandora person, you can finally listen on your favorite internet radio thing. Um, so those are, and, and listen, you can subscribe and that way when we do extra content, you can go ahead and get notified of that. Um, and we do also have a Facebook page. You can like it if you want. We, I mean, we don't really care. Um, we <laughs> share that the episode comes out every week on it, but that is more there. So if you don't have a personal connection to Ben and I, but you're listening to this podcast and you want to suggest a topic or you want to come on the podcast, 
you can reach out to us through the Facebook page. If you know either of us personally, just you know, shoot us a text. Um, we will talk about anything. If you have a topic you want to hear us cover, we will cover it. There, like there, there aren't any exceptions to that. Um, unless we've done it before, then you have to convince us that it's worth another episode, I guess. And if you want to come on, like you don't have to be a pastor or a theologian or really even a Christian. If, if you want to come on the show, we're happy to have you. We're happy to talk about it. Um, the only rule we really have is we got to keep this PG because that's the rule. So, um, but those are all of our, huh? Modern day PG, not 1990s PG. Yeah. Before yes. they had a PG 13. Yeah. Yes. Back in the good old days where a PG movie could still have, anyway, not important. Um, those are our shameless plugs. Before I get even more distracted, I'm I'm gonna release you from your your bond to this podcast with uh, <laughs> brothers and sisters. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to Thanks God. Be to God.